Hello, everyone, and welcome to Vanguard, Conversations with Women of Color in STEM. I'm your host, Dr. Jedida Eisler, and I am elated that you're here. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have the conversation we're having today. So I'm not even going to play games with you today and have a conversation that doesn't include where we're going in a big way. So let's talk about this thing. What's on the agenda today? Who am I? Why does it matter? Uh, I, if you watch Vanguard STEM before, then you'll know that I am an astrophysicist. I study supermassive hyperactive black holes in my day job. I guess technically it's a night, doesn't matter. That's what I do for a living. Uh, and I'm also the founder and host of Vanguard STEM. My goal uh, in coming to you tonight is to share an information-packed, resource-rich, action-oriented episode uh, that's about diagnosing and blocking. Um, this is the what I do, which is to make sure to include and engage um, in an intersectional social justice framework. So that's what we are doing here. Um, welcome from the entire Vanguard STEM squad. We're super excited to have you for season five, episode two. Our special guest today is Ina Coleman. Tonight is Ina Coleman. We're really excited to have her. Uh, if you've seen us around these social media streets and you've seen this flyer, I'm gonna introduce you to her in just a second. But let me give you some stuff to orient you as you're getting ready to engage with us in this show. We are about radical interaction, so we want you to participate. First, uh, if you want a live tweet, go use the hashtag VSBlocksBias. That's where we'll be putting all our content. That's where we'll be seeing your questions, answering your questions. Also, since we're doing this Facebook Live, shout out Facebook, uh, you can put your comments below um, and we'll see them and get to them in the order that they are received, really in the order that they come up in the conversation. Same. Um, also, you can always use hashtag Vanguard STEM. That's where we live. Um, you can mention us at Vanguard STEM. You can mention me. Uh, you can mention our guest, Ina Coleman. All of us are up for discussion. Um, and like I said, you can ask questions in any possible way. We'd love to hear from you. We've got a lot to cover today, so I'm just going to jump right in with what the theme is. So we're talking today about diagnosing and blocking bias. This is a, a big show for us. We really want to get into a conversation that lets us know not only what bias is, because a lot of us know by nature, having experienced it, but also how to push back against it, how to overcome it, how to not let it sort of um, take over what we're doing. So it's in the same line as our burnout series that we did with Dr. Shine Chang, with our mental health series that we did with Drs. Amaro and Sylvie Mazula. Uh, here we'll be talking to Ina, Ina Coleman about bias, implicit, explicit, all of it. Um, and we're gonna be really creating a language around the issues that we face every day. One of the things I tweeted out was about um, how a lot of these, these things seem personal until we recognize how pathological they actually are. So we've got a lot to cover, so let's get into it. The first question we're going to get into is what is implicit bias and why should we care about it? And not really why we should care about it, because there are a myriad ways to see that. But what do we do to engage it? How deeply down the rabbit hole do we need to go? How do we engage our colleagues, our advisors, our coworkers, colleagues, all of these things? How do we engage that? How do we block it? And then really the core of Vanguard STEM, how do we make space for ourselves as we move through these STEM streets? That is the core feature of Vanguard STEM, and it's a part of every attitude. Um, so just by way of brief introduction of what implicit bias is, it's an attitude or a stereotype that affects our understanding, actions, or decisions in an unconscious manner. We're definitely going to get uh, Ina to tell us a little bit more about that, but I wanted to at least start concept, context with that. That's the question we're going to be going after. And if you've never taken the sort of famous test on implicit bias, you can do that at implicit.harvard.edu. It's a really enlightening thing to look at. Uh, it, it's uh, sitting at Harvard is the Project Implicit, which is a not-for-profit that looks at unconscious bias. So. Who do we have talking to us about implicit bias? We have Ms. Ina Coleman. I'm going to read her introduction, and then I'm going to bring her up to the stage. Um, her, she's an independent expert in organizational development, and she focuses on gender equity, inclusion, and diversity. 
She analyzes organizations, environments, and organizations' environments and rec recommends concrete actions to improve inclusion and diversity, um, employee morale, and efficiency. Ms. Coleman's work focuses on data gathering, diagnosis, feedback, planning, evaluation, and follow-up. As the former managing director of the Feminist Majority Foundation, shout out Feminist Majority Foundation, uh, she's a leading global not which is a leading global not for profit whose work advances the social, economic, and political equality of women. Her work included public education programs, public policy development, launching intrapreneurial ventures. She'll tell us what that means. Uh, leading leadership training and organization organizing forums on issues of women's equality and empowerment. Ms. Coleman has significant experience communicating and compelling business case for fostering diversity and inclusive workforces. She's a graduate of Stanford University and Harvard Business School, and she serves on several boards, including Stanford's Clayman Institute for Gender Research, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about today, um, and the university's Humanities Science Council. Um, we're in, a, in addition, she serves on the Harvard Business School Board of Dean's Advisors and the boards of USC Annenberg Center on Communications Leadership and Policy and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. You are doing a lot, so we are very thankful to have you. Welcome to Vanguard STEM, Ina. Uh, let me bring you up now. Welcome. Thank you. So glad to, glad to be here. We are excited to have you. I remember when we first met at TED earlier this year, we like stopped at a at coffee and started talking about diversity and inclusion. Do you remember that? I do. Well, so much fun. fun. So much fun. So much fun. So I'm glad to have you here, especially given all the work that you do. Um, we know that you're an expert on these issues, and so we're really looking forward to diving in. Uh, so I, let me just ask you a first question, which is sort of given the rich heritage you have of, in ex expertise, how did you first become interested in bias as a subject that you wanted to master? Sure, I get asked that a lot. It, it first, I first wanted to get involved in bias and equity when um, I used to work in real estate development. And I ran the numbers and the spreadsheets and would sit around uh, with, in meetings. And I was the only woman. And I had the information, the expertise. And the people in the room would only talk to the men. And it was very frustrating for me because I, you know, I, I, being young in my tw 20s, I didn't want to assume it was because I, I was a female. But it kept happening and happening. And I said, there's something going on here. So that's when I left uh, real estate and want and started working with Feminist Majority Foundation because I wanted to get involved in shining the light on what's going on with women and girls and equity and more equality. I then left there because I wanted to focus on the lack of women at the top in business and now my work has morphed into making sure women of color are included in that conversation. So it was my own personal experiences with bias, which by the way still happen today. <laughs> Nothing hasn't changed that much, but I'm more aware of it and I know how, how to deal with it in a professional um, and uh, calm manner to have an impact uh, versus when I was in my 20s. It's really interesting because, you know, many of the uh, women of color in particular that we work with with Vanguard STEM uh, and even some that are not in Vanguard STEM talk a lot about having personal experiences, often sadly negative. Uh, in fact, many studies have shown this, right? Uh, but have those as the primary motivating factor for wanting to do something, right? Wanting to make it better or different um, or easier for folks coming behind them. And so to hear that, you, you know, you share that same heritage is really important. It's empowering. At the same time, I'd love to see people be able to stick with what they're primary interest is uh, and not have to be doing this extra work. So I was looking at when, when we talked at TED and we were sitting there, one of the things that I got excited about was specifically implicit bias. And I know we're going to talk about both um, some implicit, some explicit, just like bias primarily. Uh, but I wanted to sort of give the audience a little bit of context just in terms from a lay person uh, about implicit bias. So when I was reading this, this comes from the Carwin Institute uh, at the Ohio State University the illustrious Ohio State University. Uh, implicit biases are pervasive. Basically, everyone has them. Um, they are distinct from explicit biases because they're not something that we can consciously control. Uh, they are, often they overlap with our explicit biases, but they are, they are not necessarily the same. Um, they don't always align with what we say we believe, uh, that you know we tend to favor our own in-group, 
uh, that implicit biases are my malleable. Are these things that ring true to you in terms of basic characteristics of what implicit bias is? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you described it. Implicit or unconscious bias is what you just described. And what's interesting about it, um, implicit and unconscious bias, is that it's not accessible through introspection. That is deep. It's not accessible through introspection. So that's what's so scary about it is that because people don't really think about it because it's in their, sub, it's in their unconscious. So it's exactly as you described. And it's you know different, um, as you described, than explicit bias because at least in explicit bias, people are motivated to control it. Um, if there are social norms in place, which dictate that their bias or prejudice is not socially acceptable. So, you know, it's, it, it's both are insipid and difficult to deal with. And it's, um, yeah, it's very frustrating. We're still talking about this. Yeah, it is. Uh, do you know who came up with the idea of implicit bias and in what context? Like how is something that is not accessible through introspection, as you said? Yes, um, I, I don't know who came up with it. Um, it's been talked about, you know, for a very, very long time because of the unconscious mind. So I'm not quite sure, um, but I'll get back to you on that to find out the research that says it's not accessible through introspection. Because when I was preparing and doing research on it for this show, I came across that and didn't get a chance to do research. But that's sort of very scary that it's not available. <laughs> it's not accessible through introspection. So. Yeah, no, that that's something that I want to come back to because I saw that and then but at the same time, I saw a lot of folks doing work on how to change it or how to improve it. And so my question was, if it's not accessible through introspection, then how could you do that? But we'll get to that once you talk about uh, some of the biases themselves. Uh, right. So let me ask you one of the questions that has been sort of on my mind from jump, and that is how does bias, whether implicit or explicit, differ from racism, discrimination, sexism, or other forms of discriminatory acts? Why are, how are those things different? Sure, um, you know what's interesting about racism, if you ask 10 people on the street to define racism, you'll get 10 different answers. I found it means something different to all kinds of different people. That being said, for me, I focus on the suffix of the word ism, um, which implies a system or a practice. So in my, in my opinion, racism is having the power to have a systemic, systemic effect on an organization or on people around you. Um, so therefore, when you talk about bias or prejudice or discrimination, sometimes those are more individual ideology. Um, by itself, it isn't systematic. However, when you apply bias or discrimination to a larger vessel whose structures and systems engage in bias, then that's for me is racism. So that's why, you know, I'm very careful before calling someone racist. I want to look to see if they're part of a system and structure or is their individual bias. That is a fantastic answer. And it is actually what I was after, right? That racism has uh, an element of power right. and that that is what makes it so insidious. And in fact, the fact that it's um, so widespread in all the ways. I forgot to say for those who are watching us that if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Like I said, you can ask them down below in the comment section. We'll see them. You can ask them on Twitter. Just use hashtag BSBlocksBias. Jump in at any time if you want to ask Ina a question. I will, but it's easier for me to do that because I'm right here. So feel free to ask questions. Okay, so let's dive in then, Ina. Talk to me about whether or not, I, I, I want to talk about specific biases, but maybe another general question before we get there is, does bias affect everyone in the same way? Yes, it does, because bias can be favorable and unfavorable. So oftentimes in the research, a lot of times um, white males don't really understand that they are they are privileged to favorable bias when there's some kind of work going on or an assignment and they're given a pass if they make mistakes. There are mistakes and they're not judged as, as critically or, or things are let slide because they're white males. So bias can be unfavorable and favorable and it affects all of us in a variety of settings. That's right, I read on, Project Implicit, this notion about sort of in-group versus 
this out of group um, bias. And basically what they said was um, when we're talking about white folks as a, as a group, they are more likely, the majority of them favor their in-group. Um, but then when you talk about black people, for example, only like a third, not only, but a third of them favor white people over their in-group. Um, and so there was this notion that like everyone is affected to different degrees by this bias. And so one of the inferences that they laid out was that it's not just, you know, an individual. It's sort of this, this like you said, the systems and the structures in place around them um, that start to impact how people view in and out groups. And, and we're certainly seeing that in the um, world we're living in right now. But can you talk to us a little bit about the types of biases, what kinds of biases are out there and how does one work to block them? Sure. So before I get into the types of biases, I wanted just to talk about how I agree with the philosophy that bias is an error in decision making. Because most leaders or heads of departments want to make fair assessments of um, their employees. But research shows that stereotypes about categories of people unconsciously influ influence the criteria that's used to make evaluations or to hire people. And both women and men evaluators you know, make these errors. And research clearly shows that the bias negatively impacts women of color at a deeper level than white women because of the intersection of race and gender. As you mentioned, I serve on the advisory board of and work with the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford, and they developed the C-Bias Block Bias Toolkit for organizations based on their work with a variety of companies and wanted to figure out how to foster fair and equitable work environments. We'll get back to the uh, C-Bias um, C -bias Block Bias Toolkit, but to get into the key patterns of bias, the first main key, key pattern of bias is a higher bar and increased scrutiny. And um, as you know, women of color face that um, pretty much every day, all day, no matter what we do, whether we're in a workplace or we're going shopping in a store, um, we come under a higher scrutiny. And a 2015 study um, of women of color in STEM, black women are more likely than other women to report having to prove themselves over and over again. And uh, about 67% of women report this prove, prove it again bias while you know, 77% of black women reported this. So the technical capability and competence of women in color and STEM is challenged much more than white women. So it's this higher bar and increased scrutiny. And um, if you have any questions about that, we can stop there and I can get into how to, how to block that. I actually, I do um, really have feedback and commentary really about that. You know, there's been a lot of work on intersectionality in STEM of late. Um, I particularly do work around women of color in STEM and that is absolutely, absolutely the case. And in fact, part of the reason we have these conversations is to bring to the surface the fact that these are not individual feelings, right? Like you feeling like you just said that and you constantly have to say it again and you did well the last time, but still people are wondering if you're gonna do well this time. That sense uh, has a language and you just gave it to us. It's a bias of increased scrutiny or prove it again. Uh, so, you know, thinking through and just having availability of that idea that people have looked at this, that it affects women, and that it affects women of color even more is super important. I remember reading the work of Joan C. Williams at UC Hastings, which is probably someone that you've engaged with or the work, her work uh, as y'all work in sort of the same, uh, similar field. And she talks about this too. And she talks about differentiated um, experiences based on your identity or your interactions thereof. And she talks about how like, we're more likely to be um, mistaken for the janitor. We're more, more likely to be, like you said, asked to prove it again. There are all kinds of, of biases around this. So this is a really, really important point. And I, I just am thankful to have the language. Because I remember when I was in graduate school, I didn't know what to call it. I just knew I, I felt it. So hearing that that is actually a thing is really, how do you block, make it, what do you do to contend with the bias of increased scrutiny? Right. Well, as far as blocking the higher bar and increased scrutiny, the key, the key effective point that claimant has found is everyone um, agreeing about the importance of criteria and not letting that criteria shift. 
So if you all agree that these are the points and this is the criteria for us to figure out what's excellent, good, or what needs improvement, you must stick to that and you must have your team uh, commit to sticking to that so the, the criteria doesn't shift. So if you notice a higher bar and the criteria is shifting where um, something is happening to you where you are, are being judged and something is different than the person next to you, then you can ask for a re-examination of the criteria used. You need to reference the original agreed upon criteria. And thirdly, you need to ask questions if it seems the criteria is shifting and point that out, you and also the team. And if this is happening, it's a good time to review the importance of the criteria. Because if, if everyone understands and lives and breathes the criteria and keeps it from shifting, and that is just makes things more, more equal and more egalitarian. But it's that higher bar and increased scrutiny is when the criteria shift and we're asked to prove ourselves more. We're asked to, to have more, more results. We are asked to do uh, perform and do things that other people in, up and around us are not asked to do to prove ourselves. Right. So let me ask you this question, uh, because I'm thinking about right now my sisters in the struggle and the graduate school struggle. Right. Like so I'm thinking of folks that are in labs. I don't have a lab. I work at my computer, but I'm thinking of folks that are in labs. I'm thinking of folks that are in groups where they have to give or receive feedback in sort of informed way. Um, how do you get to clear metrics when you're in these informal settings? Is, is there like a preemptive step one can out, you know, giving the weekly progress report or whatever that could help um, set clear boundaries. Because what I find is that sometimes even the evaluation metric isn't clear. So asking people to refer back to it is tough because there isn't something specific that we can point to. So is there anything we can do there? Absolutely. So this is a good time to talk about the Claimant Institute C Bias Block Bias Toolkit assist managers with how to identify and diagnose bias to increase managers' understanding of how it manifests in their own workplace and teams and how to engage managers in co-designing solutions by redefining and clarifying performance assessment within the organization. And um, this, if, if, if you have these clear, these clear um, designs and these clear criteria, it makes a lasting sustainable change and it blocks bias because it becomes a team-based approach versus just individual. So um, anyone, yourself or anyone interested, the Claimant Institute is happy to share the Seed Bias Block Bias Toolkit because they found it to really be effective in having organizations um, recognize the possible bias that can creep in and how teams can um, help deal with the solutions and have it be everyone be accountable for it. Right, right. That's good. And I, I also, um, in academia, the University of Michigan has done quite a bit of work uh, around um, promotion, particularly because of these um, um, biases that sink in. And you'll you'll get to that, I know, in just a second. So I don't want to um, get too far ahead of ourselves here. But like the University of Michigan is another, their project advance is another um, rich resource for um, information on how to set clear metrics. Uh, so thanks so much for for that. You know what what are other um, oh I, I guess I have another question and, and maybe it's not necessarily so much evaluation but for example if you're giving you know like a talk or a qualifier is there a way to really set not expectations but set metrics around that before one goes into that setting? I'm sorry. Can you repeat repeat the question because it faded out a little bit. I apologize. Asking about extending the conversation from just promotions, for example, to, you know, more regular things that, that someone might go through, like giving a presentation or giving a talk. Are there, are there ways to set forth, is it something that one should say, okay, I'm presenting this work on such and such, here, here are the ways that I'm looking for feedback, here are the kinds of things, I'm, like how do you do that when you're talking about something more regular, like a talk? Sure. You mean, are you talking in relation to people judging you? Are you trying to, is that what your, your question is? Yeah. So if this, if this sort of um, increased scrutiny comes up, right, then it's going to come up when you talk and such too. So how do you negotiate that in the, in the space of giving a talk? Right. So what I would say in, in terms of, of giving a talk or presentation or, or going to a conference 
do your thing. I, I wouldn't really think about it. <laughs> I wouldn't really think about it that much because you're awesome. You, you know your stuff. And so if you're professional, if you're prepared, if you take care of business and you know that you, and you know that what the environment is going to be, one piece of advice I have is understanding the culture and know, and, and think about what the audience is going to be expecting. Um, that is, you know, work culture and also in any kind of conference or presentation. And then just be that prepared and do your thing. Good job. Good, good, good. That's, Tina, see, this is why we had to have you on the show. Okay, uh, let me ask about another type of bias. Are there other prominent types of bias that we should address? Sure. The second other bias that women and women of color face is the bias of likability, or I call it you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't a phenomenon. So in mm -hmm. that same 2015 study of women of color in STEM, Although all the women who behaved in assertive ways um, were risked being seen, seen as unlikable, about half of the women reported experiencing the backlash for behaving in a masculine way, you know, whatever, at, whatever that is. And particularly the Latino women were the only group of women who reported again and again um, that they were seen as um, angry or emotional or crazy. And that's that stereotype of a hot-blooded Latino. Um, and also Asian Americans report, women report being pushed to behave feminine. So there's a huge, it's just shocking to me today. You know, I dealt with when I was my twenties and now I'm in my blah, blah, and, um, <laughs> and, and it's just shocking that we still have these entrenched cultural ideas that associate men with leadership qualities and authoritativeness and decisiveness. And we want women to be associated with nurturing qualities like warmth, friendliness, and kindness. And it, it's, you know, so basically if you have the likability penalty that if you're a woman and you're assertive, you take care of business and you don't display feminine traits, then you're not likable. But yet also the studies show that um, women that, um, you know, go the opposite direction and they are considered too nice or they're too calm and they're not as assertive, they are considered less competent. So, you know, it's you, you can't win. And men don't have this kind of trade-off. Powerful men are simultaneously seen as likable and competent. So I would say this is one of the most frustrating biases that we all face, you know, I'm sure a variety of times, whether we're at our workplace or we're negotiating with our painter or whatever we're doing, that we speak up and we just are assertive and point something out then where people will say, why are you so mad? And you're like, I'm not mad. I'm just pointing out, pointing out right. so you painted the wall. Right. Right. <laughs> anyway. right. No, absolutely. 100%. It's, it's the kind of, when I think about that, I, I remember when I was in graduate school, I was having a conversation uh, about physics. It was a homework assignment. It wasn't especially pleasant. Um, and we, we had that exchange where someone was like, well, decided, why are you so angry? And I'm like, I'm not, but it, quantum mechanics so I'm not like I'm not like super jazzed about that thing I'm trying to learn it right and so that's certainly certainly a thing uh, we had the pleasure of presenting at UNESCO about Vanguard STEM and one of the things that is core to our identity as an organization is creating space for intersectional identity that is to say uh, allowing folks to be the fullness of who they are uh, and be STEM experts right and the reason why I bring that up is because we know for sure that STEM spaces are um, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly masculine, and overwhelmingly heteronormative. So the farther you are from that identity, the more likely you're going to feel uncomfortable or unwelcome. And also, the more likely that, you, like you said, you're going to run afoul of these stereotypes of what folks think you should be. Um, and it makes me think of, and, and, and my question here is, uh, how close is this bias of likability to sort of the bias of cultural fit, right? Because we're, we're again talking about like how folks fit in um, and how much we like them or not based on the same behavior. So how close are those two things in, in their um, sort of like, uh, and then the way one experiences them? 
Sure. So I'll talk about that and then I will um, offer some suggestions on how to block the likability like penalty. So they, there's various similarities and also differences. So mm -hmm. the, the similarities is, you know, some of the language I used was cultural expectations. So that's where they're, mm -hmm. that's where they're, they're similar. Where they're different is, um, and you, and you talked about, I think this was a University of Michigan study where they did a study of um, the hiring and finance and consulting and investment banking fields. And it was fascinating because the people did the hiring basically said that, well, even though she was more qualified, I mean, they, they, they admitted this, even though she was more qualified, I picked him because I'd rather play golf with him. So it, oh my God. So it is, so that's a cultural fit. And, and that's a problem. So what is cultural, and that's a whole other show, what does cultural fit mean? What does cultural fit mean? And that's one thing that more and more companies hopefully are taking stock of is that we, you know, we need to be careful of what, what we're calling cultural fit. Because just because someone may not play golf or you may not want to have a beer with them doesn't mean they're not a person that you wouldn't want to work with or they would be an incredible value, valuable asset to this company. So I got, that's, 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 you know, so it's like, a, there's some differences and some similarities. I just have to co-sign. I had to put us both up here to co-sign because that is so true, right? The, the idea that one has ownership of culture and what the, the proper culture should be is problematic. I don't play golf and I don't drink beer, but that does not mean I'm not an amazing astrophysicist. Exactly. You know, uh, and so I think about I think about all of those spaces. And but but the question and, and you're about to get to it, I suspect, is, you know, how do you deal with it? Because oftentimes there's like the initial reaction where you're just like, did that just happen? Uh, one of our uh, viewers is talking about, you know, remembering calmly pointing out an opinion and being told she should calm down. Right. Uh, these these are problematic notions. So how do you block that? Sure. So. First point, point one is that as the team and, and, and as an individually, we need to notice undue criticism of women's personalities. So um, as we've stated, that re um, research shows that women's reviews are more likely to contain negative criticism of their personality and their communication styles, not their skills. So for example, her, peaking, her speaking style and approach can be off-putting at times. Um, you don't hear that oftentimes of men in their reviews. So if you see a similar pattern on your team and evaluations and hiring, then question, you need to question the criticism and you need to, need to ask, do, do we only include criticism of women's personalities or communication styles and not conduct the same level of scrutiny of men's styles? And also every right to ask, would you criticize a man for that same approach? Because asking questions shines the light so again, it's asking questions, which brings up the conversation. So that's point one. Point two is general advice on building social capital and relationships so that colleagues get to know you. That could be another show. But in general right now, as your colleagues get to know you, hopefully, you know, any unconscious or conscious bias will be chipped away because they're spending time with you. And they're seeing firsthand how skilled and accomplished and wonderful you are. So once people and key leaders get to know you, you'll, you'll be naturally become more of the network and hopefully it will be a more organic um, involvement in some of the, the networks and some of the, the social experiences that happen that are a part of any kind of workplace culture. But I advise young people whenever I talk to them, you know, ask the CEO out to lunch. They're like, no, I couldn't do that. I'm like, why not? Why not? And, and by the way, she or he will be like, what? Sure. I mean, because they'll be so impressed <laughs> that you have the guts to do that. So ask people to lunch and get to know them and they're getting to know you. So these are really important points, right? And I have a little bit of concern there, especially when we're dealing with folks that are um, that don't have as much power. 
uh, the way the power dynamic is is offset. So you know the thing about when I think about spending time, which I think is a fantastic idea. My concern is that sometimes that is a lot of emotional weight, right? Like a person has to deal with. Then now you're in sort of in pseudo intimate settings where you may be. Um, faced with increased stereotypes, with increased sort of uh, engagements with un potentially racist, sexist, all kinds of um, ist behavior. And so I'm, I'm wondering if there is a sort of a framing around that that might not make it so important for, say, the woman of color in STEM or the person who is being sort of accosted with the bias for them to take have to take responsibility for it. Is there is there a way that folks who are sort of perpetrating that bias can be held more responsible for that? Let me ask that and then I'll get to my second question. Sure. I, I hear what you're saying. I guess the point what I was making was that there's nothing wrong with having lunch with a colleague. So um, yeah, I, I get your point about I was taking it to the extreme, but when I said CEO, but you know, asking the depart the head of your lab to grab some lunch because you had questions about a particular um, you know, project. I'm, I don't know much about STEMs. I might be using the wrong terminology. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, right, and, right. And, and you should be doing that anyway. It has nothing to do with bias or unconscious bias or standing out or brownie points. It's something you should do anyway because you'll learn some things. So um, so that was sort of the point I was making. Regarding the response. Yeah, and that's a really good. Uh-oh. Regard uh, okay. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Regarding um, your point about, yes, you should never do anything you're not comfortable with. So some of the advice I'm giving is after you have gotten the lay of the land in your environment, mm -hmm. obviously don't, don't do this your first week, but um, <laughs> you know, after, after you've gotten the lay of the land, you sort of you have an idea of the culture, the workplace expectations, and people know your work, then um, then I would mix, I would follow through in this, those suggestions. As far as the people that are engaged in, um, you know, engaged in, in bias, um, it goes back to my earlier point that I made that it's a case of where when the time is right and there's evaluations or comments or performance um, or projects coming up and comments that are made that have bias in them, that's a time for the team to bring that up and shine the light and ask questions. And that, and that promotes a discussion of, um, are we holding everybody at the same standard? Right, and in fact, you know, it is true that in the academic space, I think about, you know, attending office hours, going to research um, professors meeting, there, there are occasions to be in the same space, but I just wanna make sure that we, um, alongside saying, you know, get to know them, be in their space, ask them out to lunch or whatever that we also make sure that we're we're protecting sort of the the, met, the cognitive load on folks who are already pretty put upon um and then and then the other thing you know and it's just it's just a thought it's not necessarily something that you have to get into so much is you know wanting to not just make space for an individual right because sometimes when we spend time with folks in there they're like oh you're the special one right like you're the good one and it's like no 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 i'm a, i'm i'm a human being and there are others just like me and uh, some not so like me but that is not a, a, a um a, a, i am not the exemplar i am i am a, an instantiation of, of a human being so thinking about that too actually we had a question come in from one of our um viewers about and it's sort of a generational question um has there been any research about how women of color and stem that are sort of in the current generation those are in the in the throes of it now um versus how say earlier generations of women of color and stem dealt with bias um are there any sort of tools that still work that are multi-generational um any any research about differences in 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 those relationships yeah that's a good question i do not know so you have yeah. uh, motivated me to go and and re and look that up but i would generally say and this is a very generic um cliche answer is that things have gotten better there's been little steps little wins here and there so i imagine i'm thinking of you know may jameson the astronaut from stanford um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm hoping that, um, you know, the things that she went through, I'm hoping that current young, young women, um, that are studying to be an astronaut 
hopefully they're not facing some of the things, same, same things she did. So I'm going to think positively <laughs> and hope that and I'm going to make some assumptions um, because of the, some of the changes we've had societally wise that things have gotten a little bit better, but I don't know the research. So I'll have to check that out. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, it, it is the case that um, certainly the experiences have uh, evolved. Uh, they're, they, in some ways they're better, in some ways they actually aren't, which is galling uh, to those of us who have heard stories from Mae Jemison and the like and realize that there are stunts. Same thing that you were saying earlier, right, in terms of um, being in your 20s versus being in the we don't remember, but it's it's a perfectly wonderful place. <laughs> so it is it is sort of galling. So let's keep trucking along. Are, what other types of bias are there? Sure. So one of the last biases I want to talk about, because we've got lots to continue, lots to cover, is um, women are more likely to receive vague, vague feedback during performance reviews um, than men. And research through the Clinton Institute shows that, um, you know, specific feedback tied to outcomes is very critical to being evaluated and being, um, you know, being promoted where people can see what your efforts, the results of your efforts. And so men are often offered um, a clearer picture of what they're doing well and more specific guidance of what's needed to get the next level than women. So um, I suggest there's two articles um, that are in the Harvard Business Review that I highly suggest that everyone who's watching read. The first one I think you're going to bring up is research. Um, giving feedback, research, vague feedback is holding women back. And it was written by the director of the Clayman Institute, Shelley Carell, and one of her, her colleagues there, Caroline Samard. And it's an excellent article on describing the, this phenomenon and why it's critical for all of us to be aware and look at that. The second article that I highly recommend is also in the Harvard Business Review. And it is entitled, How Gender Bias corrupts performance reviews and what to do about it. And the author is Paola Chechi de Meglio. And she actually, re she references some of the research and, and some of the research in uh, Shelley Carell's article. So, you know, how to, how to block this. What people need to do is if you're involved in a performance, you have a performance review and, and you're being, there's comments about your personality, your characteristics, and not enough about your incomes, you have every right to ask for specific, specificity. You're, you have every right to ask for feedback that's develop, developmental and how you can improve. So it is very important that we lay out to uh, man managers that it is critical to women's, um, women's promotion and evaluation to invest in this critical feedback because it makes a more equitable environment so that they're evaluated properly and evaluated the same um, and given the same feedback, developmental feedback as men are. That is really, really important. And, and in fact, it's one of the things that I find most impactful vague feedback because you know it when you see it. You ask a question and what you get back isn't really an answer. It's just a string of words all right. put together. Right. Um, and, and, it, and I just didn't know having gone through it that that was a bias that like the fact that I'm asking you a question and you're giving me um, vague feedback that's not actionable uh, I had no idea it was a bias. And in fact, I was just talking to one of my mentees in a mentee capacity, and we had that conversation. She was asking for specific information about schools, types of schools, which would be the best schools given her interest. And what she got back was evaluations of like her capacity, what she's able to do. And, and it was like, that was not at all the question. Just right. wasn't the question. Right. Um, and so this is a really impactful one. And Something that I'm picking up through your, your blocking mechanisms is that it is important to ask questions. It is, is okay to ask questions, and in fact, it's imperative. So can you tell us a little bit about how one would block vague feedback? Sure. So um, 
you know, if you, if, if you get an evaluation and the feedback that is given to you is not uh, specific, it's not developmental, then what you do is you, you like, well, like we just said, you just ask questions and then you can ask questions about your performance and your skills and you actually are bringing it up. You're, you, you actually are praising yourself, but not, but sort of under the radar. Going, right. So, so when I, again, I'm sorry, I don't have science language. So when I did X, Y, Z in the lab and it resulted in this promotion and us getting this award, um, tell me how I could have done that better. I know things like that. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating. It happens. Know that it happens. And what I tell people, anybody, you know, young, young women, young men, is that part of your job is you. You need to, you, no one's going to look out for you except for you. So do not apologize. Don't feel bad. Don't feel guilty. And if you ask in a tone of professionalism and respect and ask the question and you point out your, your work and you are asking for constructive feedback and constructive criticism, then the person evaluating should give it. Uh, I think it's interesting in reading these articles. Um, I think, some of them say that people oftentimes aren't comfortable giving women that detailed feedback because they think that they can't take it and that their feelings will get hurt. And so that, again, is a whole stereotype in itself. But you might, if that's the case in your dynamic, you might have to let the, let the person know that that's not an issue with you when you want, you want to hear it because you want to get better. You want to improve. You want to know how you can achieve excellence so you'd need that feedback. That is a really good point. And in fact, you know, one of the things that I that I have come to do over time to counteract that in my own life is, like you said, I just ask very specific questions. Like I don't generally walk into someone's office, no matter who they are, and ask them what they think about a thing. Right. Because I'm going to get a whole bunch of feedback that I don't really need or want. Uh, and so I generally do like to be very specific. Now that means that my preparation for meetings is much more involved, right? Because now I need to figure out what am I truly trying to get feedback on? Um, and this plays for me with another notion that we've talked about here on Vanguard STEM, which is namely um, when, where to get support, right? And that not every person is equally qualified to give support on the same stuff. Um, and so it helps for me dealing with um, how to focus questions. And then I like your point of following them up with even more focus questions and, and pushing back a little bit about, OK, so now that we've had that conversation, what else can I do? I, I really, really love this. This one, like I said, has been really powerful for me to think about as a form of bias. And again, like so many of these things are things that we know, we felt in our spaces before. They are rampant in STEM. Um, Kate Clancy just did a study on women of color in astronomy and women of color in astronomy face more discrimination than white women. That's just, it is just the way things go um, and, and different forms of discrimination. And so thinking about the fact that there is a literature around this, that there is there are specific things one can do is really, really powerful. Um, so I wanted to do, I know we've got uh, just a little bit of time. Ina, you've been really great. We've really enjoyed having you. Um, I know we don't have a, a huge amount of time left. So let me uh, ask you this, because when we were talking, you gave a pro tip about um, introductions that I want to go over. Um, but actually, maybe before we get there, I'll leave that because I have this other question that I just realized I want to ask. I, I actually really want to go back to the point about malleability of bias um, and how uh, folks can can fix their bias, right? So um, we talked about how one can block it, right? Like how we can sort of push back a, against what is being faced with us. But how do people actually reprogram their biases? What does one have to do to make that happen? Oh boy, that's a tough question. Um, that, yeah, that, that, that is, that starts with the person even admitting that they have biases because that most people, most people don't. Yeah. So if, if you're at a place emotionally and mentally that you can say, you know what, I have these biases. And I'm going to figure out how I cannot let them affect my, my decision making. 
I want to make sure that when the next person that walks in here for this job, that I'm because of what they're wearing, because of what they're saying or their accent, because of their skin color, um, because of whatever, I'm not going to let that influence my, how I evaluate them. So it's, you know, that that is a question that's very in, individual. I sort of talked about teams and departments, but most, I, I just find that most people um, don't really want to admit that they're, that they have biases. So if, if yeah. a person can, then they, then they can be completely open-minded when someone walks in their office. That's right. They at least have the chance to respond in a way that reduces it. And then if the person who's sitting on the other side is able to question and push back in, in the ways that they can at the time that they can, depending on their capacity, uh, then, then we start to, to get to sort of wrestling with these things in the active space. It's, it's a struggle, right? Because you come in there trying to do your STEM, just trying to be a STEM practitioner, just trying to be great at what you do. And, and, and instead, you're sort of faced with bias and having to work through that. Uh, so it's a really tough thing to, to engage. But your point about folks having to acknowledge that they have bias is a really important one. So again, if you were um, interested in taking the implicit bias test, you can find that uh, at the link that we just put up. But with our last few remaining minutes, Ina, talk to us about your pro tip on powerful introductions and how they impact bias. Sure. So I've, this is one tip that I give whenever I speak, that but it's the power of introductions. Whenever you're in um, an environment, whether you're um, at a conference, you're in a, in a social work setting, wherever you are, um, you want to make sure that you're introduced with powerful language and the language of leadership. Of course, when you introduce yourself, you can control it. But oftentimes, just pay attention um, now that you're aware of it, like how you're introduced. So, for example, if you are the, the chair of a lab uh, and you're, uh, you're somewhere with some colleagues and someone says, she works in our lab. That's not an appropriate introduction because you don't work in the lab, you're head of the lab. So what I tell people is that it's, it's subtle and it's not subtle, where if you know you're gonna be introduced or um, coming up in a setting where you're gonna be walking in, you wanna figure out how the people around you um, sort of know or aware of how to use the, the language of leadership so that your expertise and your skills instead of your personality um, is introduced. And this is critical for how you'll be viewed. So for example, I mean, I can't even tell you the number of times where if I meet a, a woman and they'll go, you know, she's a very powerful woman, powerful woman or she might have a leadership position or whatever it is, they'll go, she's really nice. I'm like, I, I'm, that, that word is so overused when we, when we, and we talk about women a lot and the word nice. Nice is good, but also is she's, she's effective. When she's, leading, um, when she's leading a meeting, she really knows how to be collaborative and get, and get the best out of all of us. So that's really critical and very important. And it's tough because you never know how someone's going to introduce you. So again, as you figure out your environments, you want to you wanna subtly like get out there in a mind meld <laughs> with your colleagues of how you want to be introduced and the language of leadership. Yeah, this is a really important point. And, and we talked earlier, and I think it's, it's worth sort of pointing to now that there are ways that we can help each other with that, right? So certainly when you're in informal settings, conferences and such, having an advisor or research or someone more senior in your field introduce you is powerful. Often they can make connections for you. And so in that case, it's hard to program what they say. I like to, I like to prime people with, with information, you know, so I, you know, I introduce this person, I them to know this about me. Uh, to help them sort of get through it. But something that you've talked about before that I think is really important is using effectively the buddy system, right? So sometimes you you can have someone you know introduce you to another person uh, and you you all can exchange the power of uh, the, the power of powerful introductions, right? Like, so I wonder if you could talk just a minute about this notion of 
uh, helping each other out and supporting each other in these spaces where we can really set the tone. So that's a question. And the second thing I was going to say is as you get to more um, formal settings of introduction, so say right before you give a talk or um, yeah, basically right before you give a talk or some other place where you, people know that you're going to go up, it's okay to have a written bio. It's okay to have that. It's okay to hand it to the person. It's okay to ask them to focus on specific things, depending on the audience. All of that is okay. And in fact, I have now come up with a bunch of things that I ask people when they introduce me. Uh, do you know how to pronounce my name? Let's practice. Um, do you know um, what is important to me in this talk? So, you know, here are the things I'm talking about. Here are the things I'd like you to prime on. And you have a really good example of and in, in when we introduce you, right? Like, so um, can you speak a little bit to that? I know I gave you a mouthful there, uh, but can you speak to, to that? Sure. So first I want to say that you're a great example of that because there, and again, there is nothing to feel guilty about, feel sorry about, or apologize for because it is so critical. Our jobs are us, or your job is you. So you want to make sure that you are introduced um, and that, you know, the leadership and your accomplishments that you have. So, you know, one last tip is that I'm, I'm talking with um, some of the women from my business school over the last couple of years. Um, it's come to light that sometimes if you have more than one woman in the room and they're in, in meetings or on, they're on a team and they noticed that um, the men were, when they would make an excellent point, the LA discussion, the men were getting the um, credit for it. So these women made a pact and said, you know what, the next time that happens, we need to um, point that out and, um, you know, if say, hey, actually, when Sally spoke a few minutes ago about that issue, she, men she mentioned that. So it's supporting each other, um, you know, whether actually whether, what people is female or male, if you see someone whose point um, is um, not attributed or taken over by someone else, you absolutely have a right to support them. and. It's an understanding that people should have in supporting each other so that they get the credit they're due and also um, get the leadership and skills that they've exhibited making that excellent point. So it's um, women having that pack with each other and, um, and it's okay to have that kind of understanding because the only way that we're going to make sure that they're given, given what they're due in those kind of settings. Ina, that what a wonderful place to end with women and particularly women of color in STEM getting what they're due because we bout that life in these Vanguard STEM streets. So thank you so much for being our guest this evening. It has been such a pleasure to speak with you to get some language and action items around identifying and blocking bias, really excited about those things. Uh, quick recap, we're talking about the bias of increased scrutiny, the bias of likability, and the bias of vague feedback. We've got all kinds of resources we'll be sharing from Ina um, and from our research team all through the week, sorry, all through the, the month. So thank you, Ina, for joining us. We're so thankful that you were here. Great. Thank you, thanks for having me. No problem, no problem. Okay, so before we so for the thank you for hanging out with us. We're really glad to have you. Let me just say a couple of thank yous. First to, to Ina, she did a great job. Please do mention her on Twitter, mention it in the comments so she knows how much you appreciate her. Uh, I was also want to say a, a thank you to the Vanguard STEM team. This could not happen without the efforts of an incredible team that they are all my Shiro's. They're amazing. Uh, to Natasha Berryman, Berryman, who's our creative director and also did a bunch Research for the show. Thank you so much for uh, Talana Hunter, who does our operations and talent management, uh, to Anika Harriet, who has been beast moding on social media as our social media manager. Also to Chris Delco Frank, who also does social media stuff, but right now serves as our digital curator and is working on this amazing series on mental health. So if you haven't gotten up on that, you should. To Leilan Carrington, who is our Woman Crush Wednesday in STEM coordinator. You want to be a Woman Crush Wednesday in STEM? You should talk to her. Um, to and our newest uh, member is Laura Vega, who's helping us doing do our edits with closed captioning. So we're really excited about our team. If you like the episode, please share it on your page. Tell everybody about it. Um, if you want to write for or contribute to Vanguard STEM, send us an email at hello at vanguardstem.com. 
Uh, we're doing Motivation Mondays. It's a new series that I started in our Facebook group. So it's only for our, our BS Village. So if you want to be a part of that, come through, um, join our group. And we're going to bring Vanguard STEM into real life. We feel like it's high time that we sat down and got some together time. So if you're interested in doing that, then you should let us know. You can do that on social media or you can send us, uh, you can fill out our form at bit.ly slash B. Yes, does IRL. Don't you love it when it's late at night and your brain goes blank? I do too. Um, so that's you can hit us up there. Um, if you need some shine or you know someone that does, definitely recommend folks for Woman Crush Wednesday in STEM. We are so excited to have you. Please be a part of all that we're doing. Join our uh, Facebook group, like our page. Uh, shout out Ina, let her know, at Ina Coleman. Shout out the page. Thanks everyone who came. Feel free to donate, kick it with us, participate, be featured. We love it and we love participating with you. So until the next time, thank you for watching Vanguard STEM. Good night.